Parliament on a legislative process currently underway in Parliament relating to the regulatory framework for the private funding of political parties and independent candidates. We did this because a question had arisen whether the legislative process should perhaps be left to run its full course before this judgment could be produced and delivered. The potential problem being anticipated is, in other words, whether this judgment could interfere in some way with the ongoing parliamentary process and cause confusion that we should seek to avoid. We conclude that the production and delivery of this judgment is appropriate and inevitable. The High Court made an order that Bahia is constitutionally invalid to the extent of its failure to provide for the recordal and disclosure of information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates. Section 172 of the Constitution provides that that order would have no force unless it is confirmed by this court. For this reason, the High Court order cannot be left hanging. Its merits were debated in this court so that we may confirm or set it aside as required by the Constitution. In any event, the content of the political party funding bill and its possible impact on the issues before us was not part of the case that culminated in the High Court order. The case that was presented to the High Court that we are grappling with in these confirmatory proceedings has to do with a frontal attack that was launched on the constitutional validity of Bahia. That challenge was about the need to regulate the recordal and disclosure of information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates and was specifically grounded on section 32 read with sections 7, subsection 2, and 19 of the Constitution as well as Bahia. We hold that the ongoing lawmaking process may comfortably run parallel to this case or this judgment without the one being undermined by the other in any way. This is so because the purpose of the bill is to provide exclusively and uniquely for the recordal and disclosure of information on the private funding of political parties, not to give effect to the High Court order sought to be confirmed here. Parliament enjoys functional independence in the discharge of its lawmaking obligations, even in relation to the regulation of private funding. Whether it does so through one, two, or more pieces of legislation falls squarely within its discretionary powers. It may, for example, meet that obligation through an appropriately recalibrated BAIA alone, BAIA and another legislation, or a different mechanism altogether. What then is the significance of this case for South Africa? Some of the main issues that have arisen for determination here give a sense of what the case means to the electorate. They are one, the need to minimize the risk of voters putting into office or even electing into government a political party or independent candidate who is corrupt or somehow compromised. Two, whether a citizen's constitutional right to vote necessarily entails the right to cast an informed vote. Three, if so, whether that informed vote includes the obligatory recordal, preservation, and simplified yet effective access to information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates, and for whether the existing regulatory framework for the exercise of the right of access to information enables a voter to enjoy real access to that critical information. A true and vibrant constitutional democracy owes its essence to the existence of three functionally independent arms of the state, the executive parliament and the judiciary. And that in turn assumes adherence to high ethical standards and unwavering commitment to the affirmation or oath of office by a critical mass of constitutional office bearers. Two of these arms are political in character or orientation. Consistent with this reality, 
the architectural design of our constitutional democracy requires that leaders in these arms first be elected by the populace before any of them, including the head of state, may be elected by fellow members in the different legislative bodies to become a leading constitutional office bearer. And the constitutionally prescribed instrumentalities for rising to public office are political parties and independent candidates. The reality is, however, that it requires a lot of money not only to register for participation in the elections, but also to run a decent and effective political machinery and electoral campaign. Very few, if any, political parties and independent candidates are adequately resourced to carry out the foregoing responsibilities unaided by private funders. In recognition of this enormous challenge, South Africa has, as enjoined by Section 20, 236 of the Constitution, passed legislation in terms of which public funding is made available to political parties participating in the elections. But even that financial assistance is a pittance compared to what is required to run a credible electoral campaign. Private funding of political parties and independent candidates has thus become inevitable. But not all funders support political campaigns with clean motives. The context within which private funding must be considered is therefore that public and private sector co corruption is a matter of, gra of grave concern around the world. And it appears that the political landscape and by extension governance has not been left untouched. The need for efficiency and effectiveness in the prevention, containment, and elimination of corruption linked to the private funding of political parties and independent candidates seems to cry out for urgent intervention. A failure to respond appropriately could result in the corruption that flows from secret private funding stealthily creeping into our political and governance space toxifying it and fossilizing itself to our detriment if it hasn't already done so. When public office bearers are beholden to private funders and the voting public does not even know who funds who and to what extent, that secrecy is likely to enable corruption and a dereliction of even critical constitutional obligations at the behest of generous funders. We must always remember that some of the foundational values of our constitutional democracy are, open quotes, universal adult suffrage, regular elections, and a multi-party system of democratic government to ensure accountability, responsiveness, and openness, close quote. In the preamble to our constitution, we undertake to use the supreme law to, open quotes, lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people, close quote. And that is a government that comprises men and women committed to the basic values and principles of clean governance set out in section 195 of our constitution. All this fits well with the approach adopted by my vote counts NPC, constitutional challenge of Bahia on the basis that it fails to provide for the obligations that flow from section 32 read with sections 19 and 7 subsection 2 of the constitution. We hold that the right to vote provided for in section 19 has a critical role to play in ensuring that we realize this constitutional aspiration. It is, after all, the citizens' right to express their will on which government is based. And the proper exercise of a right to vote also enables us to have arms of the state staffed with a critical mass of highly ethical, principle and value-driven public office bearers, able and enabled to help us realize a constitutional vision or project. That dream would only be realizable if the right to vote is exercised effectively. And that effective exercise of the right 
of the right in turn depends on the voting public's access to information, particularly information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates. For voters would only be able to make informed and responsible political decisions and participate meaningfully in the governance of the nation's affairs when properly informed. For every citizen to be truly free to make a political choice, including which party to join and which not to vote for, or which political cause to campaign for or support, not only must the information be held in one form or, the, or another, it must also be reasonably accessible to potential voters. Section 19 of the Constitution highlights the right every citizen has to make political choices. Choice is of its own a loaded concept, and much more is required of a choice maker if the choice to be made is political in character and affects important national interests. The gravity of the choice is more pronounced in relation to the right of an ad adult citizen to participate or vote in the elections for any legislative body. This is because of the centrality of elections in the functioning, preservation, and effectiveness of our constitutional democracy. Section 19 also addresses the fundamental right every adult citizen has, open codes, to stand for public office, and if elected, to hold office, close code. Our constitution does not itself limit the enjoyment of this right to local government elections. The right to stand for public office is tied up to the right to open code, vote in elections for any legislative body close code that is constitutionally established, meaning every adult citizen may, in terms of the Constitution, stand as an independent candidate to be elected to municipalities, provincial legislatures, or the National Assembly. The enjoyment of this right is not and has not been proscribed by the Constitution. It is just not facilitated by legislation. But that does not mean that the right is not available to be enjoyed by whoever might have lost confidence in political parties. It does, in, in, it does, in my view, remain open to be exercised whenever so desired, regardless of whatever logistical constraints might exist. The issues before us must thus be addressed as they ought to apply to political parties and independent candidates for any constitutionally recognized legislative body. After all, the need for the recordal and disclosure of information ought to be fundamentally the same for all political parties and independent candidates, regardless of whether or not they are registered or seek to hold public office at the local, provincial, or national level. And the parties in this matter have all grounded their contentions on the Constitution. It is to those constitutional provisions that we have decided to address ourselves. The right to vote derives its fundamentality from the central role voting plays in the establishment, functionality, and vibrancy of a constitutional democracy. It is a prerequisite for the very existence of the legislature and the executive at all levels of the state. And the proper exercise of that right is so critical to the coming into being of our political arms of the state and the effective and efficient functioning of the entire state machinery that the need for transparency and accountability from those seeking public office is self-evidently more pronounced. The future of the nation largely stands or falls on how elections are conducted, who gets elected into public office, how and why they get, in, they get voted in. Only when transparency and accountability occupy center stage before, during, and after the elections may hope for a better tomorrow be realistically entertained. This case is, after all, about establishing a principle-based system that will objectively facilitate the meaningful exercise of the right to vote regard being had to its veritable significance. The system's inbuilt capacity to sift the corrupt 
from the ethically upright is an indispensable requirement. For this reason, any information that completes the picture of a political party or an independent candidate in relation to who they really are or could be influenced by, in what way and to what extent, is essential for the proper exercise of the voters' will on which our government is constitutionally required to be based. An environment must thus be created for the public to know more than what is said in manifestos or campaign trails. As will become apparent below, what is implicitly envisioned by Section 19 is an informed exercise of the right to vote. Public office is so important that it is only to be ascended to by those who have been properly examined and found worthy to represent the electorate. And that way only, I beg your pardon, and that may only be so with the benefit of information without which open codes, the ability of citizens to make responsible political decisions and participate meaningfully in public life is undermined, close quote. By its very nature, the proper exercise of this right is largely dependent on information. No wonder it takes months, at times even a year or more, for political parties and independent candidates to wage a campaign for public office. There is a wide coverage of electoral campaigns on all media platforms, and they are fundamentally about sharing information so that the electorate know more about those seeking public office. This then means that political parties and independent candidates should not be left to pick and choose what information would be held, preserved, and disclosed to those who depend on information to determine to whom to entrust their future, that of the nation, and posterity. It should therefore not be left entirely to those seeking public office to determine what should be known about them. All information necessary to enlighten the electorate about the capabilities and dependability or otherwise of those seeking public office must not only be compulsorily captured and preserved, but also made reasonably accessible. Why do private entities and individuals fund election campaigns anyway? The fact of the matter is that private funders do not just thoughtlessly throw their resources around. They do so for a reason and quite strategically. Some pour in their resources because the policies of a particular party or independent candidate resonate with their own world outlook or ideology. Others do so hoping to influence the policy direction of those they support to advance personal or sectional interests. And money is the tool they use to secure special favors or to selfishly manipulate those who are supposed to serve and treat all citizens equally. Unchecked or secret private funding from all, including other nations, could undermine the fulfillment of constitutional obligations by political parties and independent candidates so funded, and by extension, our nation's strategic objectives, sovereignty and ability to secure a rightful place in the family of nations. Our elected representatives must thus be so free that they would be able to focus and deliver on their core constitutional mandate. They cannot help build a free and open society if they are themselves, if they are not themselves free of hidden potential bondage or captivation. The cumulative effect of these responsibilities yield an outcome that requires of the state to pass legislations that provide for the recorder, preservation, and reasonable accessibility of information on private funding. If these principles were not infused into our constitutional jurisprudence, it would be very difficult to give real meaning to the right of access to information within the context of the right to vote. The role of transparency and accountability that are essential for rooting out the corruption that could be enabled by undisclosed private funding reinforces the need to, re to record, preserve, and disclose. A reasonably accessible or disclosable record in this connection thus needs to be kept and not destroyed at the discretion of the holder. But 
Not all voters appreciate the need to inform themselves and make an informed political choice. To help them appreciate this need, predictable hurdles to the free flow of information on private funding to the broader public through as many platforms as possible must be removed. Failure to ease access to information for all those who could source and impart that information to the broader public would reduce this judgment to nothing more than a pyrrhic, a pyrrhic victory for voters. To give substance to access to this information, clarity is required as to just how reasonably accessible it is, even to those who do not need it for voting, but for the education of the voting public. Contestants for public office ought to have virtually unrestrained access to information on the private funding of one another. This way, they would be able to use it to expose and eliminate corruption or the appearance of corruption tied up to funding. Similarly, the extensive reliance on the media by those seeking public office and the voting public demands that information on private funding also be availed, not only to political parties, but also to the media. And not to be left out is the academia. For the latter are a resource widely used to either provide political advice or critical political analysis on all forms of media platforms. To do that, they need reasonable access to information on the funding of political parties. But a proper basis must be laid for that information to be made just as accessible to them. It must thus be demonstrated that they too require that information open codes for the exercise or protection of any rights, close code. It would be disingenuous of a political party, a media outlet, or an academic to rely on Section 19 as if they need information to exercise the right to vote when in fact the information is required for the exercise or protection of, other right, of another right or rights. Integrity is key and must be facilitated here. And Section 16.1 of the Constitution lays a solid basis for political players, non-governmental entities, and the, academ the academia and the media to, make reasonable, to have reasonable access to it. It is an omnibus provision so wide that it appears incapable of leaving any willing passenger behind. In a political environment like elections, information on, fun on funding is needed by party members or supporters of a political cause to recruit, campaign, and generally impart information or ideas. All of them, including NGOs, the media, and academia, need to receive information relevant to voting to in turn be able to impart and cause others to receive processed information from them. These are rights open to them to exercise or protect. The state's constitutional obligation to ensure that this information is not deceptively or selectively recorded, is preserved and reasonably accessible to voters, also extends to all, especially information disseminating and public interest advancing establishments. We conclude that PAIA is constitutionally deficient because it does not provide that one. Information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates be recorded and preserved. Two, that it be reasonably accessible to the public. And three, that independent candidates and all political parties are subject to its provisions. Additionally, it suffices to say that no compelling reasons exist to justify these limitations. In effect, we say that the recordal and preservation of information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates, as well as reasonable access, must be institutionalized. This is because that information ultimately helps determine whether those elected would handle the bread and butter issues of the, pub, of the public well. The information must, so to speak, be free-flowing. It cannot be emphasized enough that it would be erroneous to construe Section 32 as conferring an absolute or blanket entitlement to seekers of any information required from whomsoever for the exercise or protection of all rights. The ease with which it is made accessible 
ought to depend on the nature of the right whose exercise or protection is sought to be facilitated. If that right self-evidently requires particular information to be properly exercisable, then a person or entity in need of it does not always have to explain the need. The right to vote is one such example. It is intrinsic to its proper enjoyment and its essentiality that all information that could reveal the potential disadvantage that private funding could bring about be recorded and easily or reasonably accessible. It is enough to lay down a principle that requires the state to ensure that the information be recorded, preserved, and disclosable in a reasonably accessible manner, and that it is not to be paid for. Millions of voting South Africans are unemployed, and even those who are employed need every run they earn to meet their basic necessities. Those who stand to benefit from these people's vote or participation in the elections ought to be agreeable to a regulatory framework that facilitates the recordal, preservation, and reasonable access to information that could shed more light on who they really are and whose favors they might have to return. That information is indeed essential for imparting information and voting. More importantly, it remains the primary duty of the state to ensure that it facilitates access to information that would enhance the enjoyment of fundamental rights. For this reason, the nature of the information on private funding is such that Parliament might, if so advised, impose on the state itself or any of its organs the duty to hold preserve and disclose that information so that voters may have ready or reasonable access to it. No information on private funding of political parties or independent candidates may be unheld or unrecorded or destroyed at the discretion of the holder and therefore undisclosable. This must, however, not be understood to be a definitive pronouncement on whether it would be justifiable for Parliament to include or exclude the recordal and disclosure of some information on, say, 10 rand contributions or the cleaning of offices or premises for free by one or more people. It is arguably an incredibly tedious exercise to have to record and disclose every quantifiable assistance or support given to a political party or independent candidate, however negligible. Jurisprudence in one of the older democracies singles out for special attention large contributions and expenditures and most generous supporters. That said, whether they should be required to record and disclose any and every help is a matter best left to Parliament to reflect and decide on. Our duty is to articulate the unfulfilled obligation in broad terms, but with sufficient clarity to give Parliament a fair sense of what is required of it. We may do so no more than, I beg your pardon, we may do no more than provide broad guidelines on what could be considered by parliamentarians in developing a fitting regulatory framework on private funding. The fundamental principle that must be underscored here is that information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates must be held or recorded, preserved, and reasonably accessible. It is also necessary to mention that we, unlike the High Court, have decided not to suspend the order of invalidity. We explain in some detail that it is not in every case that an order of constitutional invalidity is to be suspended. Guidelines as to when to do so and when not to do so are set out in the judgment. In a concurring judgment, Froneman J. explained that access of any new legislation, I beg your pardon, I'll read it again. In a concurring judgment, Froneman J. explained, one, that aspects of any new legislation not at issue in this case might have to be dealt with in future. Two, why the recordal and disclosure of information pertaining to the private funding of political parties must be systematic and continuous. And three, 
that the right to vote is the whole citizen's right and to view it only as an itemized individual right diminishes our concept of participatory democracy. Kachalia AJ concurred in the judgment of Freneman J. An order directing Parliament to address the deficiencies of PAIA within a specified period will be made and the order of the High Court will be confirmed, but only in the terms set out below, and costs will follow the result. In the result, the following order is made. One, the order of constitutional invalidity made by the Western Cape Division of the High Court Cape Town is confirmed in these terms. 1.1, 1 .1. it is declared that information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates is essential for the effective exercise of the right to make political choices and to participate in the elections. 1.2, it is declared that information on private funding of political parties and independent candidates must be recorded, preserved, and made reasonably accessible. 1.3, it is also declared that the promotion of access to Information Act 2 of 2000 by IA is invalid to the extent of its inconsistency with the Constitution by failing to provide for the recordal, preservation, and reasonable disclosure of information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates. 1.4. Parliament must amend by IA and take any other measure it deems appropriate to provide for the recordal preservation and facilitation of reasonable access to information on the private funding of political parties and independent candidates within a period of 18 months. Two, leave to appeal against the exclusion of the words continuous and systematic from the High Court order is granted, but the appeal is dismissed. Three, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services must pay costs to my vote counts NPC, including costs of two council. I hand down this judgment. Court adjourns. Chief Justice Mukweng Mukweng, live to us there from the Constitutional Court. Uh, making this order now in relation to the uh, PAIA Act, he says, uh, the order of a constitutional invalidity is confirmed on these bases. Uh, information on private funding and political parties uh, and private candidates, that information is essential. It must be preserved, recorded, and it must be accessible to voters. Uh, the Constitutional Court has also decided that PAIA is in fact invalid. Its inconsistency uh, with the constitutional need for information to be recorded, uh, that has now been noted by the Constitutional Court and decided, and Parliament to this end must make the necessary amendments and Parliament having uh, 18 months to do just that. So now